Hello, everyone, and welcome to another webinar by ANT Neuro Education. Um, we are happy to be hosting today's session, uh, which is about virtual reality uh, as a tool for mobile brain body imaging. I'm proud uh, to be hosting today's session um, and um, to introduce um, our um, presenter, Professor Klaus Grauman. Uh, he is the Chair of uh, Biopsychology and Neuroergonomics uh, at Technical University of Berlin uh, since 2012. Also since uh, 2017, he's been the Professor um, at Tec University of Technology, Sydney, uh, Australia. Uh, his research covers the neural foundations of cognitive processes with the focus on the brain dynamics of embodied cognitive processes. He directs the brain, um, Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Labs that focus on imaging human brain dynamics in actively behaving participants. The session will be followed by a live demonstration of uh, LSL streaming feature of the EGO191, uh, the new version of the software, and the compatibility of the dry caps uh, with the VR headset. It will be presented by Dr. Antonia Tallon, who is a Senior Application Specialist at uh, ANG Neuro. All right, before we get to the presentation, uh, I'd like to mention a couple of points to uh, the ones who are new to this platform. You have a small control panel in front of you, and uh, there is a section called Questions. Please feel free to ask your questions uh, in the course of the presentation, and we will ask them from the presenter during the Q&A part. Of course, we hope for understanding that it might not be feasible to answer all of them, but you always have the opportunity to discuss them offline with the presenter. Also, in the course of the webinar, we will have some poll questions and we will appreciate your participation in that to keep it more interactive and engaging. That's it from my side. Let's get started. Uh, Prof. Rahman, uh, thanks a lot for accepting your invitation and being with us today. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Switch the view to your screen. Okay. Thank you very much, Fanoush, for the nice invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here, happy to present my work. Um, and I am going to talk about mobile brain body imaging and the moment that I have a grasp on the technology, it will proceed. So I'm going to talk about um, virtual reality as a tool for mobile brain body imaging. So the core of our lab here in Berlin, the Berlin Mobile Brain Body Imaging Lab, um, and my team is understanding the brain dynamics underlying more natural cognitive processes. And with that, I mean um, cognition that makes use of our physical structure and that might interact with a complex and more dynamic environment. And virtual reality, obviously, is a fantastic tool to um, control our experimental factors um, while still providing um, the option to move around, um, act more or less naturally. And this is why we very often use head-mounted virtual reality in our experiments. And I would like to basically focus this talk on head-mounted virtual reality. So we all have been using VR in our experiments more or less, um, also during desktop settings, obviously, because VR has um, lots of advantages. Um, but let me start with the general idea of mobile brain body imaging and why we want to do that and how we do that. So basically, if I say natural cognition, um, that includes um, the use of our physical structure. Um, that is kind of an em em embodied cognition approach, obviously. But it's also embedded in the sense that we um, allow participants to interact with the environments, and while interacting with the environment, they change aspects of the environment. And this is part of the cognitive processing chain, basically, to predict also what is going to happen if I interact, if I manipulate parts of my environment. So again, Hetman Virtual Reality obviously here offers um, several advantages to do that, but the first point, if you want to understand the brain dynamics underlying these more natural cognitive processes, is that we have to record brain dynamics. And so we have to use mobile portable devices to image human brain activity, and there are not too many on the market currently. That would be electroencephalography, EEG. Um, so this is what we most often use in our lab. 
Um, the lab you can see here in the background, that's one of the lab spaces that we have. It's a dedicated 150 square meter space, a room um, where we allow participants to walk around, to move around, interact with their environments. Um, alternative measures for brain dynamics would be um, functional near infrared spectroscopy, APNIRS, and potentially in the near future, optical pumped MEG. That would be fantastic. Um, I think it's going to take some, some years until we are there. But there is development in, in this field, and um, more and more portable lightweight amplifier systems become available. If you want to understand, however, how the brain dynamics connect and are um, basically changed by active behavior, we have to synchronize these recordings of brain activity with active behavior. That is motion capture that we use here. So in this case, here you can see um, the face-based system, that's an LED, it's an active um, um, LED system where um, these emitters have a specific frequency and profile so we can identify um, each of this um, emitter in case of we have occlusions of things like that. So, um, But any other kind of motion capture device can be used. And recently we uh, started using more and more the HTC Vive Pucks, basically, which are um, a very affordable motion capture system coming with the Vive, easy to set up, very precise. Um, but that's something we um, can discuss also if you have a question um, regarding that. And then, and this is the point for today, obviously if you have synchronized brain dynamic recordings and motion captures so that we can investigate how brain dynamics um, control behavior and how behavior impacts brain dynamics, we have to use experimental protocols um, to investigate how these two factors, brain dynamics and behavioral dynamics impact cognition. And we often use um, head-mounted virtual reality to have absolute control over our events, over the factors that we want to manipulate, uh, while participants are still able to move around more or less naturally. And this is the huge advantage of this kind of um, VR as a protocol in mobile brain body imaging experiments. And I think before I, I, I dive into my pros and cons of head-mounted virtual reality um, protocols for this kind of cognitive neuroscience research, I think we start with the first poll just to, to get you involved a little bit. So, Fanoush, uh, I think. Yes, okay. Yes, the poll is running. And let's give it 30 seconds or so. Oh, okay. And you just give me a sign. All right, 70% voted, and I'll just share the results. All of the above, 75% of the participants voted for that. And then uh, simulator sickness, 12%, and the rest are very low. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so great. I mean, I mean, most of these issues obviously are well known in the labs. Um, and I hope that I can contribute a little bit um, more to the already existing knowledge. Um, obviously, there are several pros for using virtual reality, in this case, head-mounted virtual reality for experimental protocols. First of all, we can investigate cognitive processes while providing absolute control over our factors. And this is what I mentioned um, before. We can have complex environments, dynamic complex environments, and still have absolute control. So we basically create the real world in the lab um, with the control that we don't have in the real world. The manipulation of vectors is possible that would otherwise not be possible in the real world. We can change um, physical attributes of our participants. We can change body weight, height. Uh, we can change the physical basics of our world, basically. Get rid of gravity, um, create wormholes for spatial cognition experiments. And this allows a very um, direct access to our models, the theories that we try to test with our experiments. And this is a very powerful tool, I think. And this makes it very attractive for cognitive neuroscience research. Combined with mobile brain body imaging, head-mounted virtual reality systems allow for investigating natural cognition. That is, 
we do have control over the experimental factors, over the event presentation, but we still allow active behavior movement, even mid to large scale movement, dependent on the setup that you have in your lab. And this is very powerful and very important for several lines of research that we have at um, the B-Mobile. I think in the future, it will be more or less standard that eye tracking will be included in these head-mounted virtual reality systems. We have several systems out on the market already that include eye tracking. And this, for example, for EEG research, provides another um, very valuable um, aspect of analyzing your data because now you can start looking into fixation-based activity. So cards, um, you can track really what participants look at, not necessarily the same as paying attention to, but you can extract this kind of information in addition to your presentation of events and the behavior that you record concurrently. On the downside, I think that the display resolution is lower than natural visual resolution, obviously, but that is an issue that will hopefully be overcome in the very near future. And that I think is also the case for the field of view that is still restricted. It's not our natural field of view that we have with the current available head-mounted virtual reality systems, but that again will change in the near future. And I'm pretty sure that we will have high resolution and field of views in upcoming generations of head-mounted virtual reality. The issue that we have, and I think this is going to be more problematic because it requires more equipment, it requires additional hardware, is that we have no direct option to manipulate, interact with the virtual objects because there are no physical objects. We are missing proprioceptive or tactile feedback, touching, interacting with objects, changing our environments. And this again requires again a glass system providing um, force feedback or vibration to simulate tactile feedback, things like that. But again, here is a development that also is very promising and that might um, allow us in the near future to simulate more or less to a fine degree um, interaction with a physical environment. One of the aspects um, that you all know and that was part of this poll was simulator sickness. I think um, it's an important issue and specifically for head-mounted virtual reality, which is really immersive uh, with a very good resolution. If you restrict participants' movement in these kind of scenarios, um, you run into the risk of um, provoking simulator sickness. And um, we had several experiments where we tried to tra transition from desktop VR to investigate the different factors of visual input, immersiveness, and basically the ability to move in these kind of environments. Uh, environments. And it was really difficult. And we had um, several participants dropping out and um, some of the experiments we were not able to conduct at all because um, um, of simulator sickness. And the last point, and I think that might be one of the issues that could be of interest to you, is that we um, encounter artifacts. And if you look at these kind of artifacts, they seem pretty obvious. If you look at different um, head-mounted virtual reality systems, here, this is an example of the Venus Mixed Reality System, and this is an example of the HTC Vive. They do need strapping systems to attach the head-mounted display to the head. If you do have physiological recording sensors, underneath, this is going to be an issue. The uh, mechanical pressure that you um, put on these different sensors using these straps create artifacts, epic waves or other artifacts that significantly distort your signal of interest. And I give you um, two examples. Um, one is mechanical artifacts, and you can see that here. This is a study that we recently conducted it's a dual task um, study where participants were either standing, these are the event related potentials you can see here, the posterior electrodes in green, um, or they were walking. Um, this is the ERP that you see in red. And they had to work on a secondary visual task that was discriminating different targets, and they had to push a button whenever a target would appear by walking or standing. So it's a classical dual task scenario. You see this kind of late positive complex with onset of these target stimuli. And what you can see here is at a CPZ on the most left um, display here, we have a clear P300 late, late positive complex. This seems to be already suppressed a little bit at PZ, which is weird because usually PZ would also be one of the um, electrodes showing the most pronounced P300 complex. Interestingly then, at POZ you don't see any late positive complex anymore, while at OZ there is again 
this kind of late positive complex. And this due to volume conduction should not be the case. If you have this P3 between PZ and OZ, there should be a P3 complex complex also at POZ. But this was simply the location where the strut system of the Windows Mixed Reality was adjusted to basically fix the head-mounted virtual reality setup to the head of participants. And that impacted the quality of the recording at this electrode so massively that this electrode cannot be interpreted anymore. And depending on the strapping system that you have of different HMDs, then obviously this might be a problem for a larger number of electrodes. If you compute the signal-to-noise ratio, as you did, like Stefan Debner did, um, um, using the P3, the mean amplitude of the P3 in the gray area here, divide that by the standard deviation of the pre-stimulus baseline, this um, electrode differs significantly in signal-to-noise ratio that goes down um, compared to occipital and central parietal leads, why there's no difference at PZ, and this is also impacted by the strapping system. And this is the topography for the single task and dual task. And um, this is just to give you a visual impression, but it obviously um, impacts more than the central midline electrodes that we see here because the strapping system moves around the head and um, puts pressure on several electrodes also in the temporal region. While mechanical artifacts um, are pretty obvious, there are additional electronic artifacts. If you put uh, we are goggles on somebody's head, then you put electronics on this participant's head directly close to the sensors. On the left-hand side, you can see here the power spectrum for a simple desktop scenario. That was a virtual navigation task um, that Asain Jung in our team um, basically investigates here. And this is um, participants sitting in front of a display, our standard established lab setup, and you can see a clear 50 hertz peak. That's our notch line noise in Germany. Um, but if you do the same visual input using hat mounted virtual re reality, you can see that there is more than simply this 50 hertz um, peak. There's a 90 hertz peak. This is also not surprising because that is the refresh rate of the HTC Vive system. But if you then start integrating the hat mounted virtual reality with your larger motion capture systems, um, then there might be additional artifacts. And we're not quite sure yet whether this is only based on the head-mounted virtual reality goggles, which is unlikely, or the combination of this kind of active LED systems that we attach to the Vive to have like absolute position in space um, to better track basically um, the position of participants during this large scale navigation experiments. And you can see a number of peaks here, even, and that is also the case for low frequency ranges. Um, so this is something that we have to consider, and I think we have to systematically describe what kind of system produces what kind of artifact um, to make sure that um, we can replicate these kind of um, um, artifacts in our data, communicate that accordingly in our publications. Um, and with that, before I start with the experiments, um, as an example to show you what we do, um, there would be a second poll. Okay, the poll is running and we will give this 10 more seconds. Okay. Let's close the poll and share the results. Seems that uh, there is a consensus about the third option, increase the degrees of freedom to move. Is that correct? That yeah, that is one of the most important aspects to me. Yes, definitely. Okay. But I think um, something that is also important is that participants are very motivated in these kind of um, virtual reality experiments. So we had experiments where they really had fun. And um, we often compare like admin to virtual reality scenarios with desktop based scenarios, and um, they are way more motivated um, running around using admin to virtual reality. So there's a motivation, um, a higher involvement of participants in these experiments. And I would like to give you um, um, three examples of mobile brain body imaging experiments where we use head mounted virtual reality. And the first would be VR and mobile brain body imaging in cyber physical systems research. And this is a classical neuroergonomics 
topic where we try to understand um, how present participants feel or a user feels in a given cyber physical system. At the moment, what um, is done here is a questionnaire, so you interrupt the um, experience of presence to ask um, using a questionnaire. And this obviously is not the best way to address this kind of question. And we try to find implicit measures, brain dynamic measures that would reflect presence of users in cyber physical systems. These are upcoming systems, and so EEG or FNIR, so brain dynamics in general, can be used to improve these systems, maybe to adapt cyber physical systems to a user state, newer adaptively. And the setup here was a simple setup. What you can see here is one of the basic scenarios that we use, again, that I think is the Oculus, if I remember correctly. The Oculus this time um, combined with 64 channels EEG, and you see, no, it's a Vibe, and you see the Vibe pooks here on the hand of the participants. In this case, we only use the pooks for motion capture. And the task of participants really was to <clears throat> start a trial. So they had a resting position on this white um, field and then would start a trial by touching the cross next to this white resting position. And then uh, unpredictable after um, a random interval between one and two seconds, a cube would appear right in front of them to the left or to the right. And the task of participants simply was to touch, to reach out and touch that cube. And 70% of the trials, when the cube was touched, there was a sensory feedback that the object was touched. In this case, here you can see a visual feedback changing its color to red to indicate that it was touched. On 30% of the trials, however, we increased the radius of the collider. And in that case, the feedback that the cube was touched was given too early, prematurely, and people um, experienced a mismatch between what they saw and felt proprioceptively moving out to the object and the fact that the object already indicated it was touched. So it's kind of an oddball, like an interactive oddball paradigm. And again, here we were interested in this kind of prediction error negativity that you can see if something deviates from what you predicted. And we investigated this using three different conditions. First, we provided only visual feedback about um, the object being touched. In the second condition, we combined the visual feedback with a vibration motor, a, ling a motor on the fingertip that vibrated, um, simulating um, tactile feedback. And in the third condition, we combined these both vibration and visual feedback with electrical muscle stimulation so that we basically contracted the muscle that would pull up the hand, imitating some kind of a force. So as if you touched a physical object. And we were interested how these different sensory feedback availabilities would impact the prediction error negativity. Here you see um, the match trials, event-related potentials, color-coded in blue, the visual, in red, the visual vibro, and in yellow, the visual vibro and EMS stimulation. These are for match trials at frontal central um, lead here, FCZ. And what you can see is a clear positivity somewhere around 200 milliseconds for all three conditions, most pronounced for the EMS condition. This is not too, come too, too surprising. I mean, it was really um, irritating having this kind of electrical muscle stimulation on your arm. I did this several times and it's quite um, catching your attention, I would say. The same you can see here around 200 milliseconds um, for the mismatch trials. But importantly, we were interested in this early negativity here around 100 milliseconds that you can see here. And now, basically, because we have the EMS stimulation and the other stimulation in both conditions, we now subtract the match from the mismatch trials and get rid of the common processes taking place in both conditions and focus only on the difference. So the difference wave that you see here, the LP difference, um, clearly shows at FCZ a strong and really pronounced prediction error negativity that monotonically increases with the number of channels of sensory feedback available to participants. On the right-hand side, you can see the amplitudes. There were no differences in latencies of this component and the tendency um, with significant differences for the EMS compared to both other conditions. We interpret that simply as the more realistic the feedback, the available feedback is to participants in cyber physical systems, the more fine-grained their predictions basically can be compared to what actually happens. And then they direct their attention to correct for what was going wrong. A second example that I would like to show here um, is now 
using virtual reality, head-mounted virtual reality, and mobile brain body imaging and architectural neuroscience research. And this is a study that was um, led by Zach Jebara from Arboch University. And um, here we were interested in affordances of transition. That's a long, so transition in architecture, um, basically like doors crossing one, uh, crossing a door from one room to reach another room, um, things like that are transitions in architecture. And we were interested in how different affordances of transitions would impact human brain dynamics. And participants were basically um, located in this first room in the large lab space that you saw before, and they saw a wall with a different opening. So the wall was gray and the opening was indicated by two um, vertical lines. And that could be either white, like in this case, so um, that would be the orange. Um, there was no color, it was all gray, but this is to show how white the doors were. Um, this was the medium door, and then in yellow you see the narrow door. The narrow door was so narrow that participants could not pass through without touching the wall, and that basically um, was um, a negative feedback signal, they had to return to the starting position. The trial structure was they um, were standing in the dark, then the lights on event came up, that's S1, and then they had to wait for um, six seconds plus minus one unpredictable on the trial. And then there was an imperative stimulus to either walk through the door and then they would pick up this coin in the second room and return and then basically um, give some responses how they liked the rooms in this SEM questionnaire that we implemented here digitally. The other condition, the no-go, then it would light up red and participant would turn around directly and rate the same room. So we're not really, um, I'm not going into the details here. This is a setup this time. Um, again, usually we, if we have larger space navigation or um, tasks for participants, we use a backpack system with a Zotac computer. That's a gaming computer, high performance gaming computer that we equip with hot swappable batteries because the rendering costs energy. So usually the batteries do not last that long and, and to prevent shutting down the complete environment, um, we added hot swappable batteries so that in the middle of the experiment, we can just add a new battery and the experiment can simply go on without interruptions. Um, and we do have the amplifiers um, in the backpack and then basically we synchronize everything using lab streaming layers. So I think Antonia is going to talk about this um, at the end of this presentation. Here, in this case, again, we used a Windows Mixed Reality um, um, scenario, uh, sorry, um, HMD. And on the right-hand side, you can see the narrow door, the medium door, and the white door. And if you look at the behavior, so this is the response time and duration it took participants to reach the wall, even though if the door was too narrow to pass, they were instructed to go towards the transition and try, and they were significantly slower in approaching the transition in the case of the narrow doors, but there was no differences between the wide and the mid door. More importantly, if you look at these event-related potentials here, now we're all talking about time domain um, for now, looking at frontal central lead, again here FCZ, and occipital central lead, OZ. What you can see on the left-hand side under A is the lights on event. When participants were standing there and the lights went on and they saw the door and the width of the door basically that they should pass through. And even without knowing whether they were instructed to pass through that door or not, you can clearly see a significant difference between the narrow and the mid and white um, transitions here with the narrow transition provoking um, this more negativity at FCZ and less pronounced positivity around 200 milliseconds uh, frontal lead and a stronger positivity here at the occipital lead. And this is even without knowing whether you have to pass later on or not. And then with the imperative stimulus that indicated that they should walk and pass through the door, this is what you can see on the right hand side. Again, the same electrodes, FCZ and OZ, what you can see are clear differences in activity um, um, picked up over occipital cortex, the visual area, and frontal central leads. That would be the supplementary premotor area. I'm not saying that this is the only origin, obviously not. It's volume conducted signals we're talking about here, but the interesting point is that at an early stage, 
at the same time that you see the differences in the visual cortex, you already see differences in motor and premotor areas that, in our perspective, indicate or reflect the affordance, the ability to interact based on your physical abilities and the given environment. And that is important um, because we think that affordances impact the way we perceive our environment. And there is no clear um, sequential processing from visual information to motor plans being executed, but there might be an interaction of motor um, plans with perception at very early stages already. And with that, we go to the third poll. All right, the poll is running. Please participate. <clears throat> All right, so let's get to the answer. Investigating the interplay of brain behavior and cognition has got the highest poll. Since yeah. there is a problem with the percentages of the system, but I, I just um, read them according to the order. And then to allow a movement related artifact processing and then to investigate active movement and finally have more exciting environmental protocols. Yeah, I agree. So the first the first two answers would be the most important for us. Um, and obviously, the more rapid the movements become, the more mechanical artifacts we will get in our recordings coming from cable sway, micro movements of electrodes, massive changes in impedance associated with that, that really make it difficult to analyze the signal. Um, so having Behavioral markers, parameters that we can extract um, helps us to track these artifacts and get rid of these artifacts. Um, and obviously only having this kind of combined recording of both brain um, behavior plus the cognitive processes allows us to investigate this kind of interrelationship between the three factors. And with that, I would like to come to one last example and now switching to the frequency domain. Um, and this is um, another one of our um, main research lines to, um, at the B-Mobile, that would be spatial cognition. And here we're looking at um, heading computation. And for decades now in spatial cognition research, we have participants lying supine in scanners, sitting in dark rooms, not allowed to move, and we have them navigating through complex environments and trying to investigate how their spatial representation basically builds up, how accurate it is, depending on which factors we investigate. And in all of these studies, obviously, participants are not allowed to move. So if you look at natural spatial orienting behaviors, that include head rotations, turning of your physical structure that is associated with acceleration signals coming from the vestibular system, with proprioceptive feedback, with motor efferences, obviously, to um, execute these kind of movements. And all these sensory feedback channels are used for building up spatial representations, specifically in the vestibular system. That's used um, um, effortless. So it's an um, efficient means to directly update your egocentric position and orientation in space. So we were interested in how this actually would look like in actively rotating participants. You can see here, again, the setup, um, backpack, Zota computer. This is the HTC again. It's a 156 channel setup, actively amplified electrodes in this case, and we had 28 channels of electrodes in the neck area because we wanted to record neck muscle activity and to see how that contributes basically to the ICA decomposition that we used, um, the quality of the decomposition, and whether we can add more information to our analysis using this kind of activity. And the task was pretty simple. Participants were um, had to orient towards this kind of beacon, so there was a pole that would then disappear and replaced by a sphere that rotated around them, ending unpredictably on the trial on the left or right side between 30 and 150 degrees. Then it changed its color 
and participants were instructed to rotate back and indicate their initial heading. That's what they did, and then they responded, confirmed. This gave us then over underestimation, time of outward backward rotation, all the information that we needed for the behavioral results. And obviously also then the brain dynamics. Importantly, um, in this case, we really directly contrasted the MOBI condition where we had active physical rotation with a traditional desktop condition that you can see on the right hand side. This was um, the same visual flow, the same task, identical stimulus material, but the rotation was controlled using a joystick. So what we have been doing for decades now in the lab um, to contrast that directly with what we can do with mobile brain body imaging and using head-mounted virtual reality. And if you look at the behavior, there is a significant improvement in heading accuracy for the mobile, the physical rotation condition in green. We um, basically clustered the eccentricities to these three mean eccentricity clusters, 45, 90, 135 degrees, which you can see on the x-axis. And then you see the absolute heading error on the y-axis. And there are some more really interesting Im um, effects here statistically, but you can see that there's an increase in heading error for the joystick rotation with increasing eccentricity of that outward rotation. This is not so much the case for physical rotation, save if you pass, if you rotate past 90 degrees, then you have an um, increase in this behavior. If you're interested, we can discuss later. More importantly, if you look at the retrosplenial complex, and that is um, a super interesting area here in, in the human brain and other um, animal brains that allows for translating egocentric sensory perceived spatial information into an allocentric reference frame that is independent of participants position and orientation in space and that is basically located or stored in the medial temporal lobe so the rsc the retrosplenial complex translate this kind of information by adding heading information that can be aligned with outside um, landmarks, for example. Here you can see um, a density plot of independent components that were clustered using a rep repetitive k-means approach. And um, this is the structure we're talking about. And we were specifically interested in this structure because this structure receives information from thalamic nuclei about heading changes, and it might host heading sensitive cells itself, and it translates between egocentric and allocentric information and the other way around. What you see here is the joystick rotation condition. We're looking only at outward rotation, and what you see is a time warped event-related spectral perturbation for this outward rotation. So what, what we did here, because the outward rotation rotating to 30 degrees is doesn't take that much time, but rotating to 150 degrees take, takes way more time, so you can't average these different epic lengths. To um, get this kind of um, average activity, you have to compute the single trial spectrogram, and you do that for all the trials, and then you compute the median latencies or mean latencies, whatever you prefer, for the movement onset, that would be the joystick rotation or the hat rotation, and the movement offset, in this case here, joystick offset. And then you time warp basically your spectrogram, so you preserve power values, but you lose phase information. So there's no time information anymore entailed in these kind of images, but we have power changes over the time course of the outward rotation. And what you can see here is a clear phase reset in the theta range um, with onset of the stimulus. That's something that we know from our studies, from lab-based studies. And we also see um, a 10 hertz desynchronization and some higher frequency bands that desynchronize over this time course of the outward rotation. And you can see this alpha band desync um, that's with the um, within the right dotted lines here. And then you see with movement outside, uh, offset, there is again this theta um, phase reset. So the question was, how would that compare to active physical rotation? And the point is, obviously, there's something else going on. Um, in this case, um, the differences are significant across the full board frequencies here, up to 30 degrees um, and even higher. And what you see instead of the 10 hertz desynchronization is a strong synchronization in the physical rotation condition in the lower frequency range, in the theta range. 
And we're looking at rotation, outward rotation and heading computation. And we replicated this finding in a more complex path finding uh, path integration study here in Sydney together with Shen Tan Ling and, and Thong and Yen. And here participants were basically traversing different paths of different complexity and they had to update the position of landmarks and the starting locations. But you saw that there will always be a sphere popping up and they had to rotate towards the sphere and then translate. And this is what you see here. The first row again is the retrosplanial complex. Now you can see the ICs, the clusters of ICs located in or near the RSC and the sculpt topography of that cluster. Under B, you can see the um, band pass filtered theta power over the time course of these different segments. And then you see the event related spectral perturbation pattern again time warped for each of the segments. We had overall six, sec uh, six segments. And what you can see, and that's the last row and see the significant increase in theta with onset of this rotation to follow this new sphere and then disappearing, vanishing off basically during the translation. While at the same time, the increase in desynchronization of alpha power basically here that you can see continuously increases over the time course of the full um, path integration task. And we interpret that that theta might reflect the heading computation itself by the alpha desynchronization might reflect the translation between egocentric and allocentric information that is necessary to integrate your visually proprioceptive vestibular systems into an allocentric position to answer where the landmarks are and where the home position was. In this sense, mobile brain body imaging with active physical behavior might shine light on new functions that we would not be able to observe if we had participants in stationary settings. This has to be followed up, obviously. So um, before I come to the discussion, I think this is the last poll. The poll is running. Okay. Can they see my display during the poll? No. Okay, can they hear me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's give it a few more seconds and we can close the poll. Interesting. So visual, um, actually the third option, vestibular and uh, proper receptive information has the highest vote at 79%. And after that, visual and vestibular information, and the rest are visual information, none of the above. Yeah. Is that correct? So agreeable. I mean, we, we are interested in the natural co-occurrence of all sensory streams being available. So having rotation is associated with changes in visual flow as it is associated with changes in vestibular information and proprioception. So this really allows us to address all sensory channels if we have mobile participants. And this, as I said um, earlier, might allow us um, to, to see new functions of specific um, networks, regions um, that have not been observed before because we simply never had the chance to investigate actively behaving participants. Okay. And with that, I um, would like to come to the conclusion of, of this um, webinar. So I think it is obvious that if we have participants moving, actively behaving, if it is reaching, interacting with the environment in a place or up to navigating larger scale um, spaces, the movement itself will create sensory activity that is fed back to the brain it's going to be processed and by definition the behavioral state changes will then lead to changes in the brain dynamic states there there will be differences significant differences in brain dynamic states when we investigate actively behaving participants there will be no way around that and then if we move out and this whole discussion of ecological validity or real world research if we move out into the real world then obviously we have no control anymore 
over specific events happening, um, people shouting at you or looking at you weirdly because you're wearing a cap in Berlin running around. Um, but using VR, we can simulate that and get as close as possible to the factors we want to investigate while having absolute control and still allowing movement of participants. And I think this is a powerful combination that makes Hetmont a virtual reality um, um, technology in mobile brain, brain body imaging research um, very valuable. And summarizing basically what I said before is that I think VR allows for experimental control while providing the freedom to move. This is the most important aspect for us here in Berlin. Then mechanical and electronic artifacts have to be considered. And I think we really have to systematically as a community um, dwelling out in, into this new research areas, we have to systematically protocol what is happening, what kind of systems are combined and what is the result of that. And if we share these protocols and results, then I think that will be um, um, will make life, experimental life easier for many people. However, looking into the mechanical and electronic artifacts of these head-mounted virtual reality systems um, might be less of an issue compared to other biological um, activity that's um, coming from rapid movements, for example, that lead to mechanical artifacts like cable swing, amplifier movement, a micro movement of electrodes, things like that, that have way higher amplitudes um, and differ between experimental conditions while the electronic artifacts and the mechanical pressure might not differ that much between our experimental conditions. So um, nonetheless, we need to communicate what is going on and um, what we use. And then I think, as I said, active behavior changes human brain dynamics significantly. And that reflects simply efferent computation underlying behavior, the integration of sensory feedback from different sensory modalities and complex sensory motor integration when acting in dynamic environments. It's not only that we passively perceive stimuli that are presented, but we interact, we change our environment, we change our physical surroundings and we predict what is going to happen when we do so. So this is part of a more realistic approach to investigating cognition. And I think one important aspect will be that we have to compare MOBI results with traditional set of results like I did um, show to you in the last experiment that we always contrast a MOBI condition with a, a traditional setup, a stationary condition to better understand how parameters that are well established in the field like a P3, like alpha um, desynchronization, how they replicate and how they change. Morphology of um, time domain parameters might change significantly why I think frequency domain parameters might not change significantly, um, but we might discover new aspects in the frequency domain. And um, as a last point, I think MOBI itself using EG or FNIRS to adapt the virtual reality system itself can feed back. We can improve the VR systems. We can improve cyber physical systems by better embedding the user in the system by adaptively changing the VR environments to the specific user state. And that in itself is a very powerful approach um, and something I think will become more and more important for future cyber physical systems research. Okay, with that, I would like to thank all um, team members and collaborators that were involved in this research that I showed to you today and our funding um, agencies. And if you are interested um, in this, we do have a blog um, at our homepage, basically come visit us, um, visit our lab. We do have a research gate project on mobile brain body imaging. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. And we do have a mobile research Slack channel. So if you're interested in exchange, and I, I really offer to exchange information if you're working with that, if you're interested, if you have questions, just join us um, so that we can get this a little bit more active and get an exchange in this field, which I think is super exciting. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.